Well, today on the show, we're looking at antinatalism and asking, should we let humans go extinct? David Benatar and Bruce Blackshaw are my guests today. It's a rather unusual conversation for you as we hear about this philosophy of antinatalism from one of its leading proponents, South African professor of philosophy, David Benatar. Now, antinatalists argue that it's a moral duty for people to stop having any children so that human life dies out on the planet. And in his book, Better Never to Have Been, The Harm of Coming into Existence, David Benatar argues that it's always morally wrong to create more sentient beings. And we're going to find out why he believes that today. As I say, it's a controversial philosophy, but one which is becoming more widespread. There's a growing antinatalist community who advocate finding ethical ways to make life go extinct on planet Earth. And we'll be discussing to what extent David's own outlook as an atheist informs his views on antinatalism. Well, in conversation with David, today is Aussie Christian philosopher Bruce Blackshaw, who's a doctoral researcher at Birmingham University. Among other things, Bruce has written extensively on the moral case against abortion, an issue which obviously ties into today's debate. Um, He believes that while antinatalism is, in a sense, a consistent argument for an atheist to hold, uh, he actually thinks, from a Christian perspective, it's the wrong way to look at life and human value. So I'm looking forward to the conversation we're going to be having on the programme today. Uh, Welcome along in the studio. Studio Bruce and uh, on the line David. Um, David, we'll, we'll begin with you. Um, and I should first of all say it was a fellow South African listener, uh, Jeremy Behrman, uh, who I should give a shout out to, who first made me aware of antinatalism and, and your work, David. But uh, your profile's had quite a boost recently, hasn't it? You were featured, I think, in The New Yorker a couple of years ago to explain this concept of antinatalism. And I can imagine that when, when most people hear this idea, what, whatever their religious convictions may be, they they see it as a pretty extreme, almost fringe kind of view. What what? How do you find people respond usually to to antinatalism when they first hear about it, David? Well, perhaps I should first clarify what I understand by the term antinatalism, because you've linked it quite closely to the extinction of humanity and of sentient species more generally. Mm. And although that is an implication of antinatalism, as I understand it, uh, many antinatalists don't believe that extinction will actually result from people's commitments to antinatalism. Okay. So I, for one, am under no illusions that people are en masse are going to be persuaded by antinatalist ideas and that human extinction will, uh, will result from that. Uh, there are obviously different ways of understanding what one means by antinatalism. I understand it as the view that we ought not to be creating new sentient beings. Of course, if everybody would act on that, then uh, there would be no more sentient people. Uh, Uh, and uh, to prevent non-human sentient beings from coming into existence. That would, of course, require some kind of positive intervention rather than simply abstaining on the part of humans from procreation. Uh, So that's about what it is. And Mm. then your question was about what reactions are to it. And I think you're correct that uh, reactions are in general uh, negative. And I think that's irrespective of whether people have a religious background or not. But there is a sizable minority of people, it's turned out to be a much larger group of people than I imagined, who are actually very sympathetic to this idea. Many of these people believe that they were alone in believing that it's wrong to create uh, new beings, and they gain some measure of comfort from knowing that uh, that sort of view has been defended. Mm. And and as I said in my introduction, are, are these people, as they have been able to gather together more, I, in fact, I ran across a, a, an antinatalist podcast the other day with, that you had contributed to recently. Um, are, are they looking t- to find ways of encouraging people not to procreate, not to have more children? Are, are they actively, if you like, acti- is there an activism around this, this, this philosophy? There is. So there are some people who are engaged in antinatalism activism. There are other antinatalists who, for, for whom it's a personal decision, but they're not engaged in any activism of any kind. So as with uh, lots of worldviews, one's going to get a variation uh, among people who adhere to them. Just to explain then, and, and probably it's worth saying as well for those who are watching by a video that um, you won't be seeing David on, on the video today, um, as, as David prefers to keep uh, his image out of the public spotlight. But um, what, what? just talk to us about antinatalism then and and how you came to the conclusion that it would be better off for people never to have existed rather than for life to be brought into the world what what was the again this will have to be very much a thumbnail sketch obviously of of a much bigger philosophical argument that you make but but what's at the heart of this idea of antinatalism well i think there are a number of arguments for that conclusion 
The one is that it seems to me there's nothing to be gained from coming into existence. Uh, although if you come into existence, there are certain joys that you'll have, certain pleasures that you'll have, certain good things that you'll experience. If you never had come into existence, you would not have been deprived of those absences. There's an existing person who lacks some joy. There's somebody who's harmed by that absence. But if there's an absent joy because there's nobody to have that joy, it looks to me like there's no downside to that. Whereas if you bring somebody into existence, there are very certain uh, harms that they're going to experience. Quite which harms and the array of harms and how intense those are uh, will vary from person to person. But my argument is that even the best human lives contain considerable bad. And so the idea is that there's nothing to be gained for the being you'd bring into existence and quite a lot to lose. And therefore, for that reason, we ought not to uh, bring new children into the world. Obviously, in a sense, though, there is an almost a natural instinct within us to procreate, to bring life and so on. And many people, I think, would, would push back and say, but, but surely overall the benefits, the, the joys outweigh the potential negatives of, of bringing new life into existence. Why for you isn't that a good argument against, against what you're saying here, David? I think it's precisely because there are these very deep biological drives that we should distrust the judgments that people make. So in the book, Better Never To Have Been, I review uh, quite a lot of psychological literature which points to our unreliability in making judgments about the quality of, of life. So people, for example, in general, have an optimism bias that manifests in a variety of ways. They tend to recollect uh, the good more than the bad. They tend to think that the future will go uh, better than it actually does tend to go. Uh, there, there are lots of manifestations of this optimism bias. People also make judgments about the quality of life by uh, comparing themselves with other people. And so if other people have got similar downsides to their lives, that tends not to feature in their own calculation of the quality of their own lives. So there are lots of reasons why we should not trust most people's judgments about the quality of their life. Hmm. It's very interesting. I've got a, a, about a thousand questions I actually want to ask you in the course of this show. We probably won't have time for all of them, David. But one one that did obviously occur to me as fairly pressing at the time that we're recording this show, it comes in the midst of this present global coronavirus crisis. And um, it's sort of an interesting backdrop in a way to have this sort of theoretical conversation about whether we should, in principle, try to let humanity go extinct. I, I suppose I want to ask you, what is your view on possible biological or ecological threats to human existence? I mean, in one way, do you see them as potentially good things on balance if they actually cause less humans to ultimately exist in the world? Well, remember, I think that there are good and bad ways of bringing about human extinction. And I'm not in favor of bringing about extinction through killing people mm. uh, or through the deaths of people, because that involves real costs to individuals. Uh, the cost free way to extinction is by failing to bring new people into existence. So although existing people would die, there'd not be new people brought into existence who would then live, suffer, and die. So it's uh, my goal is not extinction per se by any means uh, necessary. I'm trying to avoid bad things befalling people, and the very best way to do that is not to create them mm. in the first place. I mean, obviously, as you say, it, it's an extremely unlikely scenario, but if everyone simply did stop procreating, obviously within a generation or so, there would be no humans on the planet any longer. Um, and for you... The, any costs associated with that, say, of the sadness of people who would have liked to be parents, not getting the joy of being parents, would be outweighed presumably by the fact that future generations of people who could have suffered won't suffer. Would, would that be the way you'd, you'd, you'd kind of do the cost-benefit analysis on that one? Well, I don't deny that there would be disadvantages to existing people in not bringing into existence new generations. The question, though, is whether we are entitled to uh, treat other people as means to our ends in that way. Mm. So if you keep reproducing, keep producing new generations for our benefit, and then those new generations have to suffer, and they need to produce new generations for their benefit, what we have is what I call a, a procreational Ponzi scheme. And eventually it's going to go bust, like all Ponzi schemes do. Uh, there will come a time when humanity will go extinct. It's very unlikely to be as a result of antinatalist convictions. It's much more likely to be the result of some meteor from outer space or some uh, the planet becoming uninhabitable or a disease that uh, ravages the earth. Uh, those are the likely explanations. Mm. And then there will be a final generation. So it's not like we can avoid uh, that evil. That evil will occur one way or another. The question is whether it's going to be sooner or later.
Interesting. I, I want to come back, obviously, as well to to the um, the aspect of how your atheism sort of um, affects the way you kind of do the, the weighing up of these issues as well. And I think that'll be relevant as well for my other guest who I'm going to introduce now, um, Bruce Blackshaw, who's a Christian philosopher. Um, because Bruce, you're a Christian and you've done a lot of work around the bioethics of abortion. Now, we'll, we'll kind of come to how that ties into this particular debate uh, a, a little later. But I think this is the first time you've formally interacted with this antinatalist sort of philosophy. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, this is what, what, my first encounter. Yeah. What, what's your understanding of where this has come from? And, and why it's kind of it is being adopted apparently by increasing numbers of people and and your overall response to it I'd be interested in first of all well I've I've read David's book I've read three of his books now I think and the idea that life is a harm and not a gift is quite an alien one to me mm. I think particularly so as a Christian but in philosophy we don't write off a view just because it's an unattractive one mm-hmm. we want to know if it has support if there are good reasons for believing it and having gone through David's work, I've read quite a few respons- academic responses. He has got his philosophically. He's got. I think he's got a good case. And so we can't just write it off and say we don't like uh, what he's saying. We have to, you know, go a little dive a little bit deeper. And and when you say philosophically, he's got a good case. Is that if you accept, if you like, the fundamental premises of of the way we do these kind of calculations of of cost and um it's not so much that um as i understand just to dive into the philosophy just Mm. a little Mm. uh there is something philosophers call the asymmetry which is that we have a duty to avoid bringing people into existence who would leave miserable lives Mm. but we don't really have a duty to bring into existence those who would have happy lives a lot of philosophers think that makes a lot of sense Mm. but that that sort of intuition we have is quite difficult to explain. And many philosophers have tried to do so, and maybe David can correct me here, but as I understand it, his argument for antinatalism does provide an explanation for this asymmetry. And very few people have managed to provide such an explanation. So that is one good reason for accepting his views. Could you, could you just comment on that, David? Yeah, I think you're correct. There are other advantages as well to accepting the asymmetries that I think underlie my argument. For example, they solve a whole range of problems in population ethics that are otherwise quite intractable. Yeah. So I think there, yeah, there are exa- that, numerous advantages to, um, to, to this view. Yeah, there, there are a number of asymmetries, but that's the particular one that seems to be one of the uh, most important ones. And so even to me, it's a conclusion I don't like. I do recognise that there is some strengths in your there, argument. There's a kind of a logic to it. There is a logic to the argument. And I guess I'm interested too to know whether David himself likes the conclusion of the argument or whether it's something you've come to reluctantly. Is that some, If you come to it through logical argument, think, well, this is, this is the yeah. best explanation. That, that's an interesting question, David. Do, do you kind of like the, the consequences, if you like, of, of your philosophical reasoning here? But I don't like all the consequences because the thought, let's say, of people not having children when they want to have children and being saddened by not having children, that's hardly something that one can like. Sure. Uh, but it does strike me that the conclusion is true. Another, another part of the, the loss, if you like, that I feel uh, with the idea of antinatalism is the idea that, let's say, hypothetically, that you did get to that presumably best outcome of no future generations of people existing what you would lose in terms of simply the idea that humans wouldn't continue uh, that no future art uh, music literature cultural development would ever happen it feels to me like you're maybe losing something that's a little bit hard to put a value on somehow um so I don't know if that if that factors at all as well, David, in, in the way you, you look at this. Well, I think when we view that sort of prospect with sadness, we are engaged in sentimentalism. Uh, we, we sort of want the human project to continue because we are human and we, we want there to be something of humanity that survives us. But it's hard, I think, when we look at reasons for why we should be sad, for us to be sad about that. If there are no more humans left, nobody to appreciate art and music, well, the absence of those things is not bad. And we don't spend any time worrying about how on Mars, for example, or Jupiter, 
there's no sentient life and therefore no um, a Martian art and music. We never spend any time worrying about that. So if there were a future in which Earth were uninhabited by human beings, and therefore there were no human creations at that point, no ongoing human creations, I don't think that would be something that would be... Uh, yeah. That would be okay, it's an interesting point. I mean, coming back to you, Bruce, you, you've said that you can see the logical consistency from an atheistic perspective of, of antinatalism, having having read through yeah. it and, and looked at the responses. Why then, as a Christian, do you find the idea actually, I suppose, in some sense, doesn't make sense to you from, from that perspective? Why, why, why do you come to a different conclusion ultimately? Because you don't share, presumably, the, the atheistic uh, underpinnings of David. Okay, that's, that's a good question. Uh, while I was researching this talk, I did come across Mark 14, verse 21, which mm. says, Woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man, which Jesus is speaking, referring to Judas. It would be better for him if he had not been born. So, <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting, yeah. So I thought, Analogy. hang on a minute, that's that's endorsing David's <laughs> argument here. So I thought David might appreciate that. Okay, well, what, that verse aside, what's what's your general kind of reason, though, why you, you don't think this philosophy kind of holds from a Christian perspective? Well, from a Christian perspective, I think God has himself, if, if, if we ex- accept uh, the Christian point of view, God ex- himself has placed... A lot of value on human beings. Mm. Uh, if we look at Romans, uh, hang on. Ephesians one verse four, for mm. He chose us in Him before the creation of the world. And to me, that says God has a long-term plan for each one of our lives, and we are chosen for a purpose. And if God has chosen us, that places tremendous value upon each human life. And so, and so the the cost benefit analysis isn't simply about. The pleasure versus pain that any potential life may exactly yeah. it, it's actually about some intrinsic value to that's right. to, to, to being alive to that's having, right. yeah. and i guess from so from a christian view that's pretty obvious that god has placed a lot of value on us and I'm, I'm interested to see what david thinks of whether consciousness itself has intrinsic value whether he thinks the fact that there are sentient beings in the universe is a better universe than if they're not sentient beings in the universe could you comment on that one david Yes, I don't think it's better because uh, sentience comes with uh, all the horrors of existence. So if you're insentient, then you never suffer. They're not, they're not bad things that befall you in a meaningful way. It's not that there can't be bad things that happen to you. Just I think it matters if you're not sentient. Right. Uh, so I actually think the world without consciousness, without sentience, is a much better world. It It, um, it is a strangely kind of contradictory view though to to most people's intuitions and i speak here of most atheists i know actually david because in a sense if an atheist does happen to doesn't believe that there's any kind of intrinsic value to human life you know given by god but nonetheless is glad that life arose albeit by some you know happy accident or whatever they generally want to see that life continue and they're glad that it's there and, and they do all they can to make sure it does flourish and continue in the world rather than seeking to to eliminate it in the universe. They're glad that consciousness arose by whatever means. So it's a sort of a strange kind of paradox that that you actually stand against that quite natural intuition, I think, in many people that, that well, now life's here, let's celebrate it, let's make it continue, let's f- cause it to flourish rather than wanting to ultimately see see, see it um, die out. There are lots of things you said there that I would like to address. So mm. the one is about continued consciousness of an individual, and the other is about continuing consciousness by creating new conscious beings. So uh, I do think that if a being already exists in a conscious state, that it has some interest in continuing to exist, which is one of the reasons why I think uh, it's bad for that being to kill it or for it to die. Uh, but it's a separate question about whether it's good to create new conscious beings so that there will be conscious beings in the future. Uh, But another point is that you've implied on a few occasions that there's a kind of divide here between theists and atheists. Mm. On the other hand, you've acknowledged that there are a lot of atheists who uh, are not anti-natalists. And so what I would like to do is really just emphasize that I don't think that the divide is along atheist or, or and, and theistic lines. Uh, Bruce has provided me with some quotations from the New Testament, which seem to support uh, an, an antinatalist view. Uh, in Better Never to Have Been, I cited a number of biblical verses that also support an antinatalist idea. And one of the things I do in the book, albeit briefly, is to try to show that 
these ideas should not be readily dismissed on religious grounds. There are actually streams of religious thinking uh, that do support antinatalism. Uh, in Christianity, there was a, a sect, the Shakers, that were resolutely opposed to procreation. As you can imagine, they're a very small uh, sect, and they uh, danger of dying out. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have to can only get converts in. They can't uh, get new progeny to uh, keep, keep the, the, the movement going. But there is a, a, a strand of Christian thought there. Uh, in the Catholic Church, you've got uh, priests who do not engage in procreation, or at least they ought not to engage in procreation. Um, I cite uh, an interesting debate in the Talmud, where, uh, curiously, uh, the view is espoused that it would have been better if humans had not created, uh, if, sorry, God had not created uh, humanity. Mm. And um, this, the, it's, the Talmud relates that that debate went on for two and a half years, and eventually the decision was made in favor of that view rather than the alternative view. So they are really, they may be minority and small streams in mm, religious mm. thing, but I don't think we should be viewing this as necessarily antithetical to, uh, to theists. In fact, there may be some quite good theistic arguments uh, for antinatalism. So it's going to depend in part on your metaphysics and what you think about souls, but let's imagine when you create a new being, you are uh, bringing a new being into existence. It's not like there's some soul that's in the void and it's now being incarnated. Uh, well, and you also, let's say, believe in uh, in original sin. Why would you want to create more beings with original sin? Why would you want to do a thing like that? If you believe in predestination, as some Christian groups do, and you believe that uh, people are going to go to hell in certain circumstances, why would you possibly create a being that's destined for hell? Mm. Uh, now, I don't want to I don't want to suggest that these arguments are knockdown arguments, uh, and that uh, all theists ought to be committed to them. What I'm suggesting is that there are strands of theistic thinking uh, according to which antinatalism would make eminent sense. Mm. What, do you, what do you say to that yourself, Bruce? Yeah, well, I mean, prior prior to starting the talk, Justin and I were just discussing this, and yeah, there is... I can see that there is some reason if you you know believe in original sin, as Christians do, and if there's an eternal punishment for sin after we die, then perhaps there is a reason not to bring people into existence, uh, because if they're going to suffer that punishment. So I can see some logic for that view, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It, it kind of gets you into the weeds of the theology of, say, a Calvinist predestination does, view, yeah. because obviously, at some level, our decision to to or not to have children at that level is not really in our hands if you are if you're a thoroughgoing calvinist anyway so 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 it kind of goes to a, a deeper level in a way but it is a fascinating thing I, I appreciate the way you've you've elucidated there david that um, certain strands of theology might might actually be open to a kind of antinatalist sort of interpretation um, we're going to go to to a break and and we'll continue <clears throat> with more questions. I've got loads more questions that I want to throw into the mix as well on, yeah, on this I've got a few as well. <laughs> um, because because uh, since since I discovered this, um, you know, rather interesting branch of philosophy, uh, it's it's fascinated me as to as to what the consequences might be of it. And we'll continue to to kind of unpack some of the um, Christian and atheist kind of implications. I think of of it as well as we go in today's show. We're talking about antinatalism, and as the name suggests, it's about being against procreation, believing that actually it's uh, morally better not to create more sentient beings. That's the theme in David Benetter's book, Better Never to Have Been, The Harm of Coming into Existence. He defends that as a philosopher. There's a growing antinatalist movement out there. But what do you think about it? I'd be interested in your responses to today's show. Remember, you can email in unbelievable at premier.org.uk. You can also send in your thoughts via our social media too, uh, at unbelievablejb for Twitter, facebook.com slash unbelievablejb for the Facebook page where we're over on the instagram as well you can find all of the links including to my guests and their books and uh, blogs and so on from today's show as well at premierchristianradio.com forward slash unbelievable and we'll be back very shortly welcome back we've got a really interesting philosophical discussion today i'm joined by two philosophers on the program uh david benatar and bruce blackshaw now david benatar is south african professor of philosophy whose book better never to have been the harm of coming into existence outlines an anti-natalist philosophy the view that it's always morally wrong to create more sentient beings effectively he argues that people should stop having children so that human life in principle could die out on the planet one day now whether that's realistically possible is another question in a way but but we're talking about the the philosophy here the uh behind this um and bruce blackshaw joins me as well christian philosopher who's done a lot of research uh looking at the moral case around abortion now 
I think there's there's a kind of an interesting practical dimension to this when it comes to the issue of abortion, because I'd be interested to know, David, on, on your view, what for, for people who do subscribe to the to an antinatalist view, is abortion something that they should therefore do if they find themselves pregnant for any reason that they should actually choose to terminate that life um, and, and what would be the, the boundaries on that, in, in your view? Is does, so effectively, does antinatalism kind of necessitate abortion uh, wherever possible? I don't think it does. Uh, you have to have some additional views that you couple with antinatalism in order to get what I call the pro-death view about abortion. Uh, so it's possible to be an antinatalist uh, but also to believe that a being comes into existence in the morally relevant sense at the time of conception, and then uh, it's too late to prevent the being from coming into existence. It's already come into existence, so abortion wouldn't do that. Abortion would then kill a being. If, on the other hand, you combine antinatalism with some view about fetal moral status, such that uh, the being only comes into existence at a later point during gestation, then you could still prevent a being from coming into existence by aborting at one of the earlier stages. So the important point is that antinatalism by itself doesn't imply anything about abortion. You have to couple it with some other view about mm. when one comes into existence in order to get some view about abortion. And, and from a personal perspective, where, where do you find yourself on that spectrum? Do you believe that um, there is a point at which uh, sentience, if you like, occurs later in gestation and therefore it is morally preferable to abort up to a certain point in, in gestation? So part of the question is about what uh, what is the criterion for, for moral standing, moral status. And if you do think it's sentience, then I think you need to uh, hold the view that uh, the being only comes into existence in a, in a morally relevant way around 28, 29, 30 weeks of gestation, because that's where all the evidence suggests the fetus becomes a sentient. And, and would that be your, your view, just, just out of interest? My view is that sentience is uh, in, an important criterion, that we should okay. be focusing on that. Okay. Um, uh, w obviously, you've done a lot of research in this area, um, Bruce. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on, on the kind of the link between antinatalism and, and abortion uh, yourself. Yeah, I mean, I think David's absolutely right. It depends on your view of pers what's called personal identity, really, when when a new being exists and uh, from David's point of view we don't really exist until 28 weeks and so that would mean it would be it would make sense in fact you'd have that moral obligation to end your pregnancy before then to prevent that child from coming into existence so I, I think that would be consistent with antinatalism. What's your actual view though? Just, just My, my yeah. actual view is the first view that David referred to is that uh, we have moral value from conception and so from an antinatalist point of view, if I was an antinatalist, uh, abortion would be impermissible from conception. Mm. It's interesting. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I, I perhaps just clarify. Bruce was correct in speaking about a moral obligation to uh, to perform an abortion or have an abortion if one combined antinatalism with the, with the sentience view. Mm. But it's quite important to distinguish that uh, obligation from there being a legal entitlement to force people uh, to to abort. Of course. So it's yeah. very important yeah. by yeah. abortion to distinguish between the morality yeah. of abortion and what the law ought to say about abortion. So although I do think that in the earlier stages of gestation, uh, people ought to be aborting, I do not think that the law ought to be forcing that on anybody. Indeed, um, because in a way I don't, I, I'm assuming as well that you're, you're not in favour of laws that would prohibit procreation in, in the sense that you know obviously china has for instance adopted in the past um one child policies and so on because of population growth now do you do you support those kinds of governmental um restrictions or do you actually think no we should just let people do what they want to do and it's up to their own conscience whether they choose not to have children ultimately well i think there's some government interventions that are appropriate and some that are inappropriate so if for example a government were incentivizing lower birth rates uh, that seems to be perfectly reasonable. But if a government were uh, forcibly sterilizing people, forcibly uh, aborting people, that would uh, that would be problematic on my view. That's interesting. So so you're open to the idea of government incentivizing, but, but not obviously to actually forcing people not to have children in, in those kinds of ways. Yeah, yeah. I mean, governments provide all kinds of incentives of different kinds. And mm. uh, we need to evaluate each of those incentives. 
first of all, in terms of what they're trying to achieve, and secondly, in terms of the permissibility of the actual incentive, and also the effectiveness of the uh, of the incentive. But I've got no in principle opposition to incentives. I mean, a lot of people these days are choosing to self limit as well. So I, I mean, I'm thinking of that well publicised example of Meghan Markle and Harry. Um, I don't think I'm allowed to call them the, the Duke and Duchess anymore, but um, <laughs> they they said publicly that they'll limit themselves to a maximum of two children because of their concerns around climate change and overpopulation and so on. So so does that kind of choice to have less children, does that also map onto to antinatalism in your view, even if people aren't saying we won't have any, but we'll, we'll limit the number? Yes, yeah, so at the outset, I mentioned that there are different ways of interpreting antinatalism. And I think that one way in which you could use that term is to refer to a reduction in the number of beings you bring into existence. Of course, that's that's not a, that's not anywhere as controversial as the view that we ought never to sure. create. Uh, but it's not unreasonable to describe a policy or a choice as antinatalist if it merely seeks to reduce the number of children. We just need to be clear that that's what's meant. I mean, in that sense of antinatalism, Bruce, you could argue that anyone who uses contraception is at some level an antinatalist. They're, they're trying to reduce the number of yeah. children they're bringing into the world, even if they're, they're allowing themselves to have a certain number. But, but maybe yeah, I, more. I, that, that's a fair point, I think. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting. It, it is about those different gradations, I suppose, it, though, because for is. most people, the idea of no one reproducing so that humanity goes extinct is obviously quite a different kind of concept in that way well what did you want to bring to the conversation at this point though bruce i know you had some questions yourself uh, i have a couple of questions on antinatalism itself but while we're talking about abortion i just Mm. thought i'd uh, ask david what he actually thinks contributes to a child's moral status is it um kind of experiences or just consciousness or what what would you think endows a human being with full moral status? I think both sentience and sapient characteristics are relevant to determining how we should treat a being. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the how, what the impact that has on how we should treat a being can can vary. So sometimes, if a being has more understanding, doing something to it can be worse for that being Agreed. than if it mm-hmm. doesn't have understanding. So uh, let's say painlessly killing a being that has long-term goals is probably worse than uh, painlessly killing a being that only has short-term goals. But it's also the case that sometimes the cognitively more sophisticated being, because it's able to understand something, is actually harmed less than a being that understands the world less. So here's an example. Let's imagine that um, we had to perform to satisfy, let's say, some terrorist demand a dental procedure either on an ordinary adult human being, let's say an unnecessary dental procedure on an ordinary adult human being, uh, and um, or we could do it on a dog. Well, it might just be far more bewildering for a dog and uh, than for a human being. A human being might understand that it's having this cavity filled, this manufactured uh, cavity filled in order to save lives, and it might give meaning to this uh, a person's life to uh, to be the victim, as it were. Uh, whereas a dog would be utterly bewildered. When dogs have to have their teeth cleaned, they often have to be sedated because mm. of how harmful it is to them. So I don't think that s- increased sapience, increased cognitive capacity always means that you're more protected. I just think it's relevant to how we treat you. Yep, fair enough. That actually brings me on to a point I want to ask about your asymmetry argument. And one of your first points is that the presence of pain is bad. Um, is, is That's correct, isn't it? Correct, yes. Um, I read a book some years ago called Pain, The Gift Nobody Wants by a doctor called Paul Brand and uh, Philip Yancey. Uh, Paul Brand was a leading medical authority on leprosy, and the book explains how leprosy destroys your nerves and leprosy patients can't feel pain. It makes it difficult to know when leprosy patients have injured themselves, and that ends up getting infections, you lose fingers and toes and, and other things. And so Paul Brand explains that pain really is a gift that lets us know when our body is injured. And so I want to know if you could perhaps comment on how that fits in with your asymmetry argument, because I can't see that the presence of pain is always bad. In fact, maybe most of the time the presence of pain is informative and tells us that there's something wrong. Hmm. That's a common optimistic move. 
uh, but I think it misunderstands my position. So I'm not sure. denying pain sometimes has instrumental value. Right. It can do. I'm saying it's intrinsically bad. Okay. And if you're considering whether to bring a being into existence, uh, it doesn't need any of the instrumental value of pain if it doesn't come into existence. Right. Okay. So you can either create this being or not. If you do create it, the pain will be intrinsically bad for it. There might be some extrinsic or instrumental benefits, but those are not things that uh, you're losing out on if you don't create the being in the first place. Okay, so even though it's instrumentally good, if it's not, if you don't have the being at all, then there's no pain at all, and so you haven't harmed a being. That's what. That's I what mean, I, I was going to ask a similar sort of question, which is, I often think of it's not quite so simple as saying, well, let's just look at the the pain versus the the pleasure, uh, if you like, in a very utilitarian way, because often. Um, you know, there's a part of the the value of something is the the effort and the pain and the stress that it took to get it. You know, a great instrumentalist probably has to go through a great deal of pain of a sort in, you know, being frustrated as they try to learn the instrument and, and having to put in a lot of hours and, and hard work and so on. But there's a great value at the end of that, of, of the pleasure it brings and the value of being able to create music and so on. And, and that would apply to many things in life, wouldn't it? Now, do do you say that um, you know you, you recognise that some pains aren't necessarily bad in that sense if they contribute to some greater good, but that you don't think we need to worry about any of that in the case of someone who simply never had the opportunity to have any of those experiences? Because part of me wonders, maybe there is ultimately a value to having those experiences if if we let that life exist. That that it would be better for that life to exist and have those experiences albeit there being some pain in the process? Well, two things. So first of all, <clears throat> I think that uh, this is all reducible to pleasure and pain. When I speak in the book about pleasure and pain, I'm really just using those as exemplars of mm. benefits and harms more generally. Um, that's the first point. The second point is that the response I gave to Bruce, I think also would apply to your point, uh, Justin. So <clears throat> you're citing instances where uh, either pain or hardship or stress uh, is instrumentally valuable and nothing in my argument denies that that it can be instrumentally valuable all the argument says is that we don't need those instruments there's nothing there's no net gain to having those instruments if the alternative is not bringing the person into existence okay so if i can clarify then even if one had kind of the perfect life but experienced pain just for a very short period you your argument basically says that we would be better off not bringing that person into existence, doesn't it? Not quite. So not there's quite. a distinction I want to draw between whether the coming into existence is a benefit or a harm to the being who's brought into existence and whether we ought not to create the being. Yep. So let's imagine some hypothetical scenario where there was only a minuscule amount of harm in some potential person's uh, life. Uh, and now... I can say of that case that coming into existence would be a harm to that person, but a very minuscule harm. And that's a harm that might well be outweighed by other considerations, including perhaps the parental interest in creating that child. Okay. So there are two different questions. The one is about whether a being is harmed, and the other is about whether we ought not to bring a being into existence. And the first one doesn't entail the second one. Okay, so, so yeah. basically... Uh, sorry. And, um, sorry, you go. Um, so basically, you're saying so, some degree of harm could be justified if the benefits are sufficient enough. Well, I'm thinking if the harms were limited enough, then it might be that they could be outweighed by other considerations. But I don't think the actual world is like that at all. I think in the actual world, the harms that are attendant upon existence are just so great that it would be indecent to think that that, that could be outweighed by uh, other considerations. Um, and, and, such as a parental creating that being and yet i'm i'm aware that most people even those who undergo great difficulty and pain in life it's relatively rare for people to wish that they had never been born people seem to want nonetheless to exist and for the possibility that life will get better and to struggle through some of those difficulties that seems to be our natural human status so so does that does how does that map on then to, to to your argument here, David? If if the fact is most people most of the time don't uh, even in the midst of hardship still don't go to the level of saying I wish I hadn't been born. Does does that make well, any difference? 
yeah, I think most people can be wrong. Most people in a desert uh, under um, particular circumstances will see a mirage. It doesn't mean to say they're rarely seeing water. Uh, if you think about the the Liar Muller effect, uh, that will ha- that will be manifest in most people, but it doesn't mean to say that you're getting a veridical uh, perception of the way the world actually is. So just because something is widespread doesn't mean to say it's true. If we can give a very good explanation for why you are going to be systematically misled about something or systematically misjudge something, then we ought to give that some credence. Um, actually, I do have a question on that. Um, why do you think self-assessments of one's quality of life are unreliable. I mean, from one point of view, we can agree they are. People tend to be optimistic, don't they? I think there's plenty mm. of studies that show that. But why isn't someone's own personal assessment of their life what we should be considering anyway? What does it matter that objectively maybe their life is not as good as they think it is, as long as they enjoy and think their life is uh, one of a certain quality that they enjoy? I'm not sure well, why you think the objective side of things matters for them. I think it depends on what decision you're making. So if you're talking about an existing person right. who's deciding whether or not to continue their life, let's say they're suffering a terminal condition, there's unbearable suffering associated with this, uh, and then you may get two people who go in different directions. One says, well, I'm prepared to put up with this. This is, uh, this is better than death. And somebody else might say, well, I'd rather be dead. Right. And uh, yeah, I'm exactly inclined to defer to the person whose life it is, uh, because if they're mistaken, they're going to be the person who is going to pay the price. So I don't think it's right for us to be imposing uh, an external decision on them. But that's not the decision we're talking about when we're speaking about procreation. Now we're deciding whether to bring a being into existence. And we can't consult that being. That's impossible. So we've got to decide for it. Now, let's imagine that you could create a slave uh, create a being that would be a slave to you, <clears throat> and you could create it in such a way that would actually endorse its uh, its enslaved condition. You know that one of the one of the features of creating it is that it would endorse its status as a slave. Right. So, okay. so you're saying <laughs> self assessment would be wrong. <laughs> we wouldn't just defer to self assessment there. We wouldn't say, well, I'm going to be creating a happy slave, a contented slave, yeah. and therefore it's expected to do that especially if there was some systematic explanation for why uh, the slave, let's say, would have that adaptive preference. Mm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. interesting. Yes, it is. It, it raises all kinds of interesting sort of um, thought experiments, doesn't it, doing this? I mean, another, though, practical implication of this, I suppose something that I worry about a bit with, with the antinatalist philosophy is whether it would encourage let's say people who maybe suffer from mental health issues and some time and so on to, to 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 kind of grab onto this philosophy and say well here's a justification for me ending my life and and rather than you know and under normal circumstances we would encourage most people to seek help uh, counseling whatever medical intervention to stop them going down that route is there a danger that antinatalism kind of confirms people in their suicidal tendencies and that sort of thing david well, let's be clear, antinatalism is different from what's sometimes called pro-mortalism. Mm. So you can think that it is harm to come into existence without being committed to the idea that it's better to cease to exist. And uh, so anybody who's wanting to use antinatalism for their pro-mortalist ideas is, is, un- is misunderstanding uh, the relationship between uh, those two ideas. Now, I do think that we need to have more serious reflection on when it is the case that life has ceased to be in somebody's interest, all things considered. So although I think that death is a harm, and it is bad for the person who dies, I do believe also that there are other harms that uh, are attendant on continued existence. And sometimes it is a choice between uh, two different evils, and you've got to choose the lesser of the two evils. And I think we need to have much more discussion about uh, when death is the less mm, to evil. Sure. But, and that's obviously a, li- a live discussion here. I- I'm sure probably in South Africa, mm-hmm. you know, issues around assisted suicide and so on, when, when mm-hmm. what the circumstances of that should be when we allow someone to, to effectively take their life if, if they feel their quality of life is, you know, is no longer livable. Is that an area where you would like to see more, more liberalisation because you feel people should have more control over when they choose to I end do their think, life? I do think there should be more liberalisation of the law there. Uh, obviously, we need to have some safeguards. We don't want people with 
mental diseases, mental disorders, uh, especially ones that are curable from just rushing off and killing themselves. There needs to be some kind of safeguard against that. But I think there are many people who quite reasonably decide that it's not in their interest to continue living. And I think they ought to have more scope for, uh, for making that choice. So just as I am pro-choice on the abortion question, even when I think that people do wrong in continuing a, a pregnancy, so I think there ought to be more scope for choice here. Because I don't believe that the government should should be the final arbiter on all these matters and be in, intruding in people's lives in these matters uh, when there are serious costs to the government doing so. What's your view on that? Obviously, it takes us to the other end of life uh, it rather, does. rather than abortion, Bruce. It is. But, but yeah, that's that's a that's, it's an interesting discussion. And uh, normally, if you get involved in discussions about euthanasia, whether voluntary or not, um, you come up against people who who can give a very concrete example of a beloved parent or someone like that who's died in a great deal of pain and um you know we have to be very careful not to you know make hasty judgments there i think uh in terms of euthanasia david alluded to that there are dangers associated with it and from a practical point of view i think that's my main concern with euthanasia i don't know that it's possible to legislate uh for euthanasia without having the possibility that people will be killed unnecessarily and possibly against their will. And I think David mentioned people who are mentally ill, and that that already is happening in places like Belgium, only in very sm a small number of cases. But uh, I think the slippery slope really is real when it comes to euthanasia, and we have to be extremely cautious if we're thinking about endorsing it. I mean, David, you know, rightly says we mustn't confuse antinatalism with pro-mortalism yeah um is there a danger it will inevitably be confused though by people who in your view Dave, uh, bruce might might sort of latch onto this i think you can use some of the arguments about quality of life uh in that way so i agree i mean david i think it talks about there's a different bar as uh, between whether we should create a life and that's a different question to whether a life should continue mm. and and yeah that that kind of makes sense there but um i think it is easy to confuse discussions about people's quality of life and then go on to well maybe their quality of life isn't good enough and we should offer them the option to 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 end it mm. and i think that's from a purely practical point of view without without talking about christianity i think it's a really dangerous thing to do as a christian well, i'm, go I'm go very ahead, sorry, even more cautious yeah go go ahead sorry david uh, sorry uh so I think it's possible for somebody to misinterpret antinatalism, but it's possible for somebody to misinterpret any number of views, including Christianity. Mm, so you get true. people who do appalling things in the name of Christianity. Uh, there is no, uh, there's no guarantee that any view is not going to be distorted by somebody who is prone to distortion or somebody who's willfully trying to distort. And so I don't think we should be rejecting any view on the basis of that. I think we need to look carefully and evaluate views on their merits and try to encourage uh, more rigorous thinking about any particular view rather than sloppy thinking about it. Yeah, I think I agree. Um, can I ask a question about Christianity then? Well, why don't we do that on the other side of a quick break? Okay. Because we're already butting up against our next break and we'll, 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 I, I would like it to come back to the, the issues around Christianity and atheism and how this ties in. Um, as David has said, he doesn't think it necessarily splits down particularly theistic or atheistic lines, but mm. I, th I think there's a few more questions to be asked around that. So um, we'll we'll go to our break. Um, this is Justin Briley with Unbelievable, bringing you a philosophical discussion on quite an unusual topic today, antinatalism. My guests are David Benatar and Bruce Blackshaw. Really interesting philosophical discussion on the show today, asking, should we let humans go extinct? David Benatar and Bruce Blackshaw are my guests talking about antinatalism on the programme today. Uh, I will make sure there are links to both my guests from today's show page over at premierchristianradio.com forward slash unbelievable. Uh, you might want to check out David's book there, Better Never to Have Been. And Bruce's blog is called philosophicalapologist.com. Um, before we went to our break, though, Bruce, I think you were hoping to, to lob a question in on, you know, the, in relation to Christianity. Sure. I guess I wanted to ask David, uh, hypothetically, what difference does Christianity make to the antenatal calculus? So I noticed in one of your book, probably in your most recent book, um, if I can quote you, you say, it would indeed be wonderful if there were a benefic beneficent God who had created us for good reason, 
and who cared for us as a loving parent would for his or her children. Now, let's think for a moment that that is the case, which is what what I, I do believe. How does that affect the antinatalist point of view? Well, as I suggested earlier, I don't think that that it necessarily affects the view. So, what the part you've quoted is is not a, a premise. I think it's a conclusion. It's a conclusion of an observation about a world that is replete with suffering, not right. just suffering that is caused by humans and the falls humans. But just think about the vast amount of suffering in the in the natural world among animals, animals that are predated upon, that die of starvation and disease. There are just billions of these animals that are suffering. And when I look at a world like that, the conclusion that I draw is that it could not have been created by an omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent being. So I think the atheist conclusion is not uh, it's not a premise in the antinatalist argument. It's a conclusion of another argument. No, no, I understand that. I'm just saying if we take for a moment that the Christian view was true, how does that make a difference in, I uh, thinking in terms of uh, a life that has a little bit of harm, but is a, an almost perfect life. If we extrapolate to a life of say 80 years long and the Christian view of an eternal life with God forever after, does that perspective of a very short life here on earth and eternal life with God make any difference to that calculus well I, I in one hand i can see how it make a difference so i think that's exactly why people postulate an afterlife because it's just so unacceptable and so abhorrent that we would live for such a short period of time but one way to deny our mortality is to assume an afterlife in an, in an incorporeal immortal form so i can understand exactly what the attraction is there i think it does yeah. make the, uh, the the lot or the human predicament look less bad than it otherwise would be. Uh, the question for me is uh, whether that's a reason to accept it. And it sounds to me like wishful thinking. Um, I, I think that's a fair assessment that if that's the only reason we're postulating God and eternal life is to get around this uh, conclusion. Yeah, it is wishful thinking. I mean, that's not the only reason I, I, I believe in God, of course, but... Um, but yeah, but, but we probably won't have time to to, have time to, 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 to dig into the the reasons you do obviously believe no. in, in God and Christianity today. I mean, um, in a sense, I'm interested in in kind of as we start to draw the, the show to a close here, David. Um, I mentioned earlier that I think I've come to see in the same way that Bruce has actually that antinatalism is quite a logically consistent outworking mm. of a kind of atheistic naturalistic point of view. And, and I can see why a lot of my friends who are atheists, I will probably be saying, well, have you considered being an antinatalist? Because it kind of makes sense, actually, on if you're a vegan, for instance, and you really believe in the, the kind of, you know, balance that of ethical balances, you should probably be an antinatalist as well. It's a kind of a logical next step in a way. Now, as a Christian, I the reason I'm not an antinatalist is because I do believe that there's something extra about life that is imbued by God with with inherent value that makes it worth having even at the cost of some of the potential suffering that exists and so on. I mean, does the fact, I suppose I want to challenge you with this a little bit, David, does the fact that most people, Christian or not, struggle, I think, intuitively with the antinatalist um, philosophy, with, with the conclusion, could it suggest that um, the naturalist worldview, that, that, that naturalist worldview might itself be cast into doubt if, if we find it so difficult to accept the consequences the, 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 you know, of, of antinatalism. Could it mean that actually it suggests there is actually a, an intrinsic value to life that maybe we haven't given credence to um, uh, if, if, if we're an atheist? I don't think so. Uh, I, I think it's precisely because the conditions are so bad that uh, people enter into a state of denial. And I don't think that that is the preserve of theists. I think it applies equally to, to atheists, as you've as you acknowledged in, in some circumstances. Um, you'll obviously be familiar with Richard Dawkins and his God delusion. Mm. Uh, well, I've written about an optimism delusion, and I think the optimism delusion cuts across both theists and atheists. Uh, I think the human predicament is a really awful predicament, and people, whether they are theistically inclined or atheistically inclined, uh, are, are resistant to recognizing it for what it is. And so they desperately find some kind of, of coping mechanism. That's that's it's super interesting because it, in a way you're 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 kind of 
being incredibly honest about the kind of the reality of life in a kind of godless universe in a way that that for me i think is is grasping the nettle in in that sense yeah but but you you're suggesting that this is a problem just for for atheists and naturalists and what i'm suggesting is that you can get two kinds of uh, of optimism delusion in response to that the one is a naturalistic one that's that tries to extol all the benefits of mm. existence that tries to deny the sorts of asymmetry that i speak about in other words it's an optimism that is devoid of any theistic context but the other way to do it is to uh, opt for a theistic view and uh, and all its features that make the um the, the predicament easier to accept so sure. i don't think that I don't think this is a difficulty uniquely for naturalists. I think you're getting two manifestations of an of an optimism uh, delusion. Well, be interested in your final thoughts as we start to draw this to a close as well, Bruce. Um, well, I can see how David would think that way if that was the only reason we believed in God. And you know, I'm I'm sure from his point of view, he probably thinks the origin of religious belief comes from that kind of motivation. Uh, yeah, that's one we can't really explore in any further detail here, I guess. Um, you just have to leave it that, that you do have other view, reasons why that, you, you, that's right. you, you do um, believe. There, there therefore... are other, plenty of other reasons, I believe. Um, I've got a quote here from C.S. Lewis. Um, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because I see, because by it I see everything else. And I think that sums up my view of Christianity, that it has the most explanatory power of any view that i'm aware of and and will consequently change the 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 way you look at something like an argument from ant for Absol absolutely yeah. yeah 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 uh obviously we're, we're not going to have time to uh to dig into the the, the deeper depths of, of why you obviously both take very different views on on as atheists and christian on that but obviously acknowledge that your starting point will make a difference to, yeah, to, to right. how you weigh weigh up the the cost and the benefit of, of life and so on um I've I've really enjoyed this actually, as much as it's a sort of um, serious, potentially even depressing topic. Actually, mm -hmm. um, I, I've I've enjoyed kind of putting it through the the rigorous philosophical mill today on the show, and uh, I've thought both of your contributions very gracious towards each other as well. So, uh, David, any any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with as we uh, as we finish today's show? I don't think it's time for us to probe this in much more detail, but I have enjoyed the conversation. So, thank you to both of you. Thank you very much. And Bruce, yep. thanks for coming in. Yep. Thank you, David. Uh, kudos to you. You've, you've developed a, a very interesting argument that people find difficult to refute. So, Yeah, <laughs> it, it, absolutely. On, on a naturalistic basis, as we say, uh, it feels like there's, there's a lot to it there. Um, we will leave it there. Um, I would be very interested to hear what the response is, because I think a lot of people listening will never have come across this 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 sort of philosophy before and i'd be interested to see what what the uh listeners both christian and non-christian to unbelievable make of today's show but uh i'll give out the ways to get in touch with the show very shortly again uh for the moment it's my thanks to bruce and david for being with me on the show and uh we will see you next time <laughs>